Good. All right, so I think it's kicked off. Um, this is the study club. This is uh, where we get together and we talk about a uh, paper, a protocol, a video sometimes, and we kind of dig into it. Today we're going to be talking about bulletproofs and an implementation of bulletproofs. Oleg, I feel like you can introduce this even better, so I'm going to pass it right on to you. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Oleg Andreev, and I was uh, uh, extremely lucky to work with um, uh, brilliant folks uh, uh, at my team at uh, Chain Interstellar on the Bulletproofs implementation in Rust. So um, if you can see the screen, this is our kind of uh, the documentation page. So uh, today I'd like to kind of walk through the design of bulletproofs, why, uh, why they matter, uh, and uh, how, how they actually work. Uh, and the, kind of the ba basis material for it would be the, the notes that we wrote um, uh, as a sort of expanded documentation for our uh, library. Uh, kind of we, we dive into the paper and this is what we got to. So this will be the topic of today's conversation. Sounds good. I'm going to mute myself Great. now. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I'll uh, try to kind of make, make like uh, several pauses so people could um, ask questions. Uh, also, I don't mind uh, 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 interruptions. So if someone feels that, you know, something was kind of glossed over, uh, then please um, come forward. Um, by the way, do we do we use the chat or uh, do we have some like you know sound hints to so, to to signal those things? Yeah, I would say like what we actually need people to do is just unmute and actually jump in. But sometimes okay. we do also like if you if you have a question but you don't feel like jumping in, put it in the chat and like I'll definitely be checking in on that as well. Great. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't mind being interrupted any, at any time. So please, please do. All right. So uh, what do we start with? So what do bulletproof, what the bulletproofs are? Uh, the bulletproofs is a framework uh, for zero knowledge proofs. And uh, specifically, it's a framework for composing the rank one constraint systems. Uh, which means that you can form certain arithmetic um, uh, constraints and prove them in zero knowledge. And I call it a framework because it has, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's a low level uh, protocol, but also it's a, um, it contains certain building blocks so you can build your, uh, uh, your own application kind of layer uh, protocol with these building blocks. And the bulletproof is pretty cool because it has a few kind of cool features that uh, uh, you can call like batteries included. So one feature is that you could build constraints on the fly. So uh, it means that you can uh, uh, you not only use it for you know some static uh, constraint system or uh, so-called circuit that you can design it like once and then reuse many times, but you could also build those constraints on the fly uh, with uh, some custom parameters, which allows you to do you know some kind of pretty cool uh, kind of protocols that are not typically covered in literature on zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and another thing is that bulletproofs come with a commitment skin right away, so you don't need to implement commitments as a part of your circuit. These come for free in form of Peterson uh, commitments. Uh, so these are kind of two notable uh, features of the framework to keep in mind uh, if you have some background on you know what the rank one constraint system is. Um, so uh, uh, the the way I'll kind of kind of structure this is first uh, 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 say a few words about uh, you know the uh, what, what the constraints are, then we'll dive a little bit into how they, uh, how we transform them in a certain form that uh, uh, that allows us to build the, uh, the the actual zero knowledge proof. And uh, finally, if we have time, we could drill into the inner product uh, 
protocol, which is the core uh, piece of the bulletproof that allows us to get those compact uh, compact proofs, the the, the log log sized uh, uh, proofs. So this is a kind of cool part, and it's, it's a separate sub separate. Product construction, so we can you know kind of review it separately. So, uh, how to like think about this? So, uh, what is what is the rank one constraint system? If you uh, if you could open the documentation, that would be great. So, we have this uh, project called Dalek, a bunch of uh, cryptographic libraries written in Rust, and you should go to uh, this URL doc internal dot dalek dot rs and uh, this will show you the internal documentation for all the dalek libraries and the default one would be curve to 55 19 but you should click on the left uh, to the bulletproof screen is this just one thing is this one of the links that you actually shared in the study club already yeah okay. yeah i did uh, so maybe i'll just go find it and i'll stick it in a little higher up or like a little lower down so people can actually find it. Oh, oh that would be great, yeah. Okay. But you keep going, you go ahead, Oleg. Yeah, all right. So yeah, if you go to this Bulletproof documentation, uh, it covers both API and some code examples and the notes. So if you scroll to the very bottom, there is a list of modules. And one module is kind of special. It doesn't have any code at all. It's called notes. So if you click on the notes, then you will see this description of um, of the bulletproofs, uh, which are like kind of notes on on the math behind bulletproofs. And it consists of uh, this kind of front page uh, that talks about not notation. So I'll cover this just for a second, so we're all comfortable with the notation. And then um, there are three sections. There's inner product proof in the table of contents. There is range proof description, and there is rank one constraint system proof. So um, let's start with just a few words on notation. So first thing, if you open up the original uh, 2017 paper uh, uh, from Boons uh, and others, uh, there are some changes in the notation that we deliberately make, so they are more consistent and match our uh, code. So we use, first of all, additive notation, and second, we consistently use um, uppercase letters for group elements or for the, the for the points, and we use lowercase letters for the scalars. Also, you may notice the um, uh, the bold symbols, like this bold Y. So bold is always used for vectors. So anything bold is a vector. And also the tilde means the blinding factor. So things with, uh, so scalars with the tilde means some, some sort of a blinding factor. And the generator B with the blinding factor simply means the orthogonal uh, kind of secondary generator. So that's that's our notation. Also, we have this table. So if you if you want to really kind of compare uh, our notes with the original paper, there is a translation table that shows which letters are replaced with what. You know, overall the uh, uh, structure should be easy to you know compare. Uh, now, uh, so uh, what is a rank one constraint system proof? So. Uh, in, in the library, we have two implementations. One is specifically for the range proof, when you want to prove that some number is in some specific uh, narrow range. And separately, there is a, a more flexible API, and uh, uh, actually the underlying math is a little bit more you know, kind of extended, for the arbitrary uh, expressions. So uh, we're not going to spend a time on talking this you know specific instantiation for the range proofs um, uh, but it would be informative to kind of show it a couple of formulas on the range proofs um, to understand um, uh, what we want to do in the kind of general sense so uh, let's take a look at the range proof just to have a feel of what are we talking about uh, so if you click on this bulletproofs notes range proof module 
this is the description of the range proof. So uh, as I said again, uh, we're not going to look, dive too much into this, but this will be kind of like a, a setting in which uh, you, you, you would kind of understand what the rank one constraint system is. So uh, this is what we start with. Uh, let me zoom this in a little bit. So we start with uh, a statement that some number, lowercase v, belongs to an interval from zero to certain power of two. So let's say two, two, two to the n. Uh, typically it's like a 60-bit number or uh, oh, 64-bit number or 32-bit number or something like that. Uh, and as, as I said, the bulletproof provides you with a commitment scheme. So this number is immediately represented or is going to be represented as a Peterson commitment uh, denoted by the uppercase v. So uh, we start with this very simple statement. We want this secret V represented by commitment to be in a certain range. Uh, so to understand uh, what the rank one uh, constraint system is, uh, let's see how do we represent the statement in, in a form of arithmetic expression. Uh, we do this by breaking down the um, uh, number into individual bits. And uh, we represent it as effectively as powers of two uh, by letters A from index zero to uh, N minus one for each uh, position in the binary representation of B. In other words, we can use this angle brackets to mean the uh, inner product of two vectors. So the vector of, of the bits and the vector of powers of two. Uh, so we're kind of working towards expressing the uh, the original statement in an you know, arithmetic form. And since we need this vector of bits uh, to be uh, not any scalar, but specifically zeros or one uh, or ones, uh, we should add an additional condition saying that the uh, pairwise product of each bit, uh, bit minus one, should be equal to zero. So this is like entry-wise multiplication. So now we, uh, you, you can see that uh, now we have one statement uh, where we uh, kind of break down the V into the bits. And now we also have and statements about the bits themselves, kind of saying that these bits should be actually bits. Uh, finally, so like, this is the list of the conditions that we have. And there's one kind of extra step that we need to do. Uh, you may notice that you have the, uh, in the top statement, you have the multiplication uh, of a clear text value, which is a power of two, with a secret value, which is a bit. So this uh, is effectively a linear constraint between the secrets uh, A and B. Uh, and we call it linear because all the uh, like factors are uh, in clear text. So uh, everything that is in clear text, we can uh, conventionally call a constant. Uh, and things that are secret, we call variables because from the point of view of the verifier, these can uh, can vary, even though they're fixed with commitments, but, uh, but they uh, can be chosen in secret by the prover. Uh, but the second set of statements, and these are all in bold, so this is not a single statement, it's actually a vector of statements. Here you can notice that we have a multiplication of a secret by a secret. So this is interesting. So this is no longer a linear um, uh, constraint between the secrets. Now it's uh, uh, kind of elevating the rank. So it's now not a rank uh, zero uh, system, but rank one, because we have a, a multiplication of a secret by a secret. Uh, and in the rank one constraint system API, we would have this uh, set of uh, mu multipliers or multiplication gates that are effectively the uh, 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 constraints that uh, have their special place in the bulletproofs, where you have a secret uh, input on the left, secret input on the right, and secret output. And so to kind of fit in the framework, we need to have separate commitments uh, to, the, uh, to the left and to the right inputs. And that's why we have to uh, introduce uh, two sets of secrets instead of just one. So instead of just having the vector of 
uh, bits, we would have the uh, A left, which is a vector of uh, like actual bits, and the A R, uh, which is uh, kind of complementary vector of the uh, bits uh, uh, with uh, uh, one sub 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 subtracted from them. This allows us to express uh, the uh, multiplicative constraints cl cl clearly that fit in the framework. So we have left secrets multiplied by the right secrets. And in this case, they should be equal to zero. And the connection between the left and the right, which we're just going to in just introduce this uh, the set of the you know, right bits, complementary bits. Uh, this, again, is a linear constraint. And it's, uh, it's a kind of vector expression. So there's, uh, there are n linear constraints in this third line. So this is how uh, you, th this is how we're going to build towards the rank one constraint system. We want to have a set of uh, multiplicative constraints, which is this middle part. Oh, sorry. And we want to have a set of linear constraints between uh, any of the secrets. Uh, so the, the rest of this uh, notes are focused on this specific statement to build the most efficient instantiation of bullet proofs for the range proofs. Uh, but we are interested in going to the more generic rank, you know, rank one constraints. So we'll go back to the you know, more generic one and um, uh, uh, kind of continue there. But uh, at this point, I'd like to kind of give a little pause and if anyone has any kind of question or or maybe a like, comment that, oh, this is all clear, we all know it, so uh, <laughs> please don't waste our time. Please go ahead and, uh, and ask your questions right now. Does that mean that you can only build range proofs for powers of two? Uh, I, mean, I mean, for the limits of powers of two, or is it possible for arbitrary numbers? Uh, great, this is a great question. So uh, this, uh, uh, you can think of this as a building block. So uh, this building block allows you to uh, build the range proofs and powers of two, but you can have some number of those to express our range. So uh, shift this whole range by some constant. You can uh, adjust the expression by saying, oh, the D should be this uh, set of bits by powers two minus you know something, or you can kind of construct uh, uh, an arbitrary range with uh, a smaller uh, power of two range, uh, range proofs. Does this, does this uh, make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess it does. Yeah. You, you cut off a so, little yeah, bit it, there, Oleg. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Well, what I, mean, I need I mean, to I say know. is... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, what I mean to say, you can construct the arbitrary um, ranges with a combination of uh, differently sized uh, binary range proofs. Yeah, all right, thanks. Well, okay. can yeah. you... Uh, it's, it's like, a, I think Peter's yeah. asking a question. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Well, I would like to ask about like what kind of developer tools so you have to build the bulletproof so and what like uh, gadgets and kit uh, we have now or we do uh, how, how how deep how, on the low level level stuff do we need to go to build uh, our uh, zero uh, zero knowledge proofs on bulletproofs? Um, thank you. Uh, so the the only tool that we have so far is. Um, the Rust API to build the low-level constraints, and uh, uh, I can uh, maybe show, like, kind of it's relevant to what we just covered. So I'll open the uh, source code and show it to you. Uh, so at the lowest level, you have this uh, uh, API to multiply. Uh, let me just zoom things where you allocate a multiplication uh, constraint, uh, and uh, you can form this linear combinations of existing uh, variables. Also, you could allocate individual variables and uh, add uh, those linear uh, constraints between the variables to the constraint system. So these are very low level building blocks. And on top of that, you could build gadgets uh, Kind of progressively in a, at a higher and higher order. An example of these uh, gadgets is our 
cloak uh, protocol, which is implemented in a library called Spacesuit uh, for confidential assets. So it has a range proof implemented as a gadget, uh, and it has uh, gadgets called Split and Merge and uh, in ZKVM, which is another project that uses Cloak, you have even kind of higher level uh, tools to build uh, Boolean combinations of uh, uh, kind of arithmetic expressions. And these are all automatically arithmetized and compiled into this API. So it's it's just kind of a stack of Rust APIs that we have so far. and to, to, there's kind of plenty of um, uh, code to look and see how, how this all composes together. I see, thank you. And what about like uh, for pre-images of uh, some different kind of hashes, is there some libraries on top of that to uh, check this thing? Uh, we have a great uh, like pull request from, uh, from Cadet as far as I know. Uh, uh, let me... Oh, uh, like, let me open it up. That plugs some kind of generic ZK interface backend. Here it is. It's still in the PR. So you could look at this uh, pull request number 279. Uh, I haven't got time to you know, you know, do a proper uh, review of this, but this introduces uh, Kind of like an uh, adapter uh, API to to plug into some other uh, zero knowledge system. So if if you have some code that implements like a hash per image that works with this backend, that you could kind of use it with bulletproofs. However, there is um, uh, there is a problem with uh, kind of very complex circuits uh, uh, in relation to bulletproofs because unlike zk zk snarks for instance, the verification time is linear and the proof size is logarithmic. So for instance, uh, the uh, SHA-256 pre-image uh, would probably like a single round, would uh, be uh, uh, producing a pretty large proof, maybe uh, on an order of you know 10 to 20 kilobytes. And uh, also verification time would not be pretty, so it would be you know, maybe up to a minute or something like that. Uh, so uh, we kind of uh, like the, the protocols that we were focusing on are those that are kind of more lightweight, where we could uh, uh, avoid building g gigantic circuits. So that that's why we don't have a very good, you know, uh, kind of sample code to to do those things. But I'm pretty sure that you could have a pretty nice, uh, kind of quick, quickly built, uh, uh, kind of collection of gadgets to 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 manipulate, you know. Uh, hashes and do the like right shifts and uh, source and stuff like that. So I'm pretty sure that should be easy to do. Yeah, thanks. So pull request looks very promising. And uh, the third question that I would like to ask you, almost answer about uh, verification and proving time in comparison with SNARKs. So, uh, and you say it's logarithmic, and the proving size in SNARKs is constant time. So, uh, well, yeah, I would like to know you. Uh, can you get a brief comparison of verification, uh, proving, and calculation uh, timing? Some kind of benchmarks, or maybe something like this. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, since there's this, you know, very dramatic difference in uh, uh, between ZK Snarks and and Bulletproofs, we were not really spending time on you know comparing them on a, uh, on a, kind of same load because it doesn't make much sense. So, you would not be, for instance, you would not be deploying, you know, a blockchain system doing the kind of Zcash-like accumulator implemented the bulletproofs. That that's just like this is what the CK snacks. Yeah, I agree. It's a d different uh, uh, approach. And yes. uh, you would not be. Yeah, so it's kind of uh, the difference is so dramatic that it completely uh, influences and drives your whole architecture. So the KVM architecture is completely different from. Um, uh, Zexy or ZK Snarks, oh, uh, sorry, Zcash, for instance. Uh, and you can do things in ZKVM that you cannot do in um, uh, Zcash uh, with, you know, different trade-offs. So, uh, uh, so that's why, uh, like, 
th that's why there is no kind of accurate head-on-head uh, -head benchmarks showing that okay, this circuit is performing this well, and you know that circuit is performing that well. So the range proof uh, makes sense to do in bulletproofs, and uh, we have uh, uh, like I don't remember something like 600 bytes for 64-bit uh, range proof, and it verifies on the latest uh, Intel instruction set in under a millisecond. So that's kind of the fastest bulletproof implementation by itself with the kind of fastest uh, curve implementation behind it. Uh, but yeah, And this is like a linear uh, verification cost. Yeah, thank you very much. Cool. All right. So, um, so back to the kind of rank one constraint system. Uh, so you you kind of got a glimpse of how we transform our original statement into a, a bunch of linear and multiplicative constraints. So now let's take a look and uh, how it's going to work. Uh, how how it works generically in um, in a constraint system API. So I'll go back to the uh, notes and uh, specifically to the rank one constraint system proof notes. So here we are. So a rank one uh, constraint system API uh, gives you a, not a single um, uh, kind of high level commitment, uh, the V, the, the value that you want to have a proof about, but a list of those. So we have M uh, high level variables, so we call them. And uh, we have also, a, like in the range proof example, N low level variables, which will be our uh, input, inputs and outputs uh, to the multiplication gates. Now, uh, here I'll make a little pause and explain the difference between those uh, kinds of variables. Uh, the uh, high-level variable uh, is uh, something that has a separate individual Peterson commitment in the bulletproofs. So think of this as your external fact. So if you if you build a system with uh, like like I do uh, with confidential assets, then each individual asset will have one or two of those uh, high level variables. Uh, in my case, it's one for the quantity and another one for the asset type. If you if you have a single kind of asset, for instance, it's a confidential transaction in uh, Bitcoin, for instance, you would have a, a a single variable for um, uh, one uh, secret value, uh, secret financial amount, and another for another one, etc. So you would have an individual Peterson commitment for each, an external, uh, externally provided commitment that already exists outside of the bulletproofs. Let's say someone created a previous transaction and stored some value under some commitment. This is your external fact, and we call it a high-level variable. And in bulletproofs, they have their own special place, and they are denoted by the letter V. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, bulletproofs provides you with rank one constraint system, which means that you have the multiplicative constraints, where you effectively have uh, linear constraints, and in addition to that, you have a bunch of multiplication gates, where you have this uh, uh, extra secrets uh, that that are connected through a, a, multiplic a multiplicative relation. And the cool thing of Bulletproofs is that uh, they provide you with a commitment scheme uh, that allows you to commit to all these uh, multi multiplicative uh, kind of wires to the multiplication gates in a compact vector Peterson commitment. So I'll explain what this means. Uh, you uh, uh, when you create the proof, uh, you start with those high-level variables that you have up front, like your facts that you want to prove some relation, uh, some statement about. And then when you kind of form your statements, you would find yourself needing uh, a kind of helper uh, uh, variables to those multiple. We started with just one external fact. The, the, the secret B, and then we found ourselves uh, in need for those extra uh, bits, the zeros and ones that we need to break the V down into. And when you have to do that, uh, then you, uh, so to speak, allocate the multipliers uh, in, in, the, in this bulletproof constraint system, and you have to choose those 
uh, uh, inputs to the uh, to the multiplication gates. So in case of the range proof, you have to choose where the, uh, which of those are ones and which of those are zeros. And all of these variables are sort of low level because they, they were not provided as external facts. You just create them as, as, a, as sort of helpers. And the cool thing, you don't need separate individual Peterson commitments for each of those wires. In fact, it would be um, a linear in size because you would be wasting space for all these individual Peterson commitments. So what Bulletproof gives us is uh, a single compact commitment for all these uh, kind of wires uh, sticking out of the multipl uh, multiplication gates, uh, which are called left, right, and output with the letter uh, A. Uh, and this is pretty cool. So you have a kind of very compact commitment to all of this um, uh, mul multiplication gates. So these are types of the variables that we have. Uh, this is the one half of the uh, relations that Bulletproof provides us with, which is the uh, multiplicative relation between the left, right, and output kind of wires. And finally, uh, the big list of linear combination of all the variables that you have. And in uh, Bulletproofs, you have uh, left wires for all the multiplication gates, right wires, output wires, the external uh, high level variables, and things that are called constants uh, because those are clear text. Uh, clear text values that are kind of constants from the perspective of the verifier. And these uh, bold uh, uppercase uh, W uh, uh, terms, those are matrices with weights. So effectively, this statement says that we have some number of uh, linear constraints uh, that connect arbitrary combination of left, right, and output wires on the multipliers the external Vs, and some constants. And these are all linear constraints. OK, so that's, that's kind of our uh, setup. And, and the, the, this, is, this provides the general, uh, general purpose rank one constraint system. And I'll, uh, you, know, you probably have a, you know, a, a little bit of a glimpse how the uh, range proof would work in this. Uh, but I, I could go um, uh, kind of kind of one short round explaining how it would look like. So in case of range proof, you would use one of the wire as a bit, another one as the bit minus one, and set the third one to zero. And then you would create the necessary linear constraints between all these wires to describe the relationship between those. So. If you want the uh, the left to be uh, uh, sorry, if you want the right to be the uh, left minus one, then you would have a linear uh, constraint just for that, where you would have something like uh, weight one on the left wire plus uh, uh, weight, I guess, uh, minus one on the right wire. Uh, plus nothing on the output equals uh, uh, minus one. So the C would be minus one. Uh, and then separately, you would have another linear constraint saying that the corresponding output wire should be zero. So you would have weight one on the output with all the other weights being zero equals zero. Uh, and one extra linear uh, constraint would be for um, uh, the V express the powers of two of all these uh, left wires, where each left wire is a corresponding bit in the binary representation of V. So if you have a 64-bit uh, range proof, then what you would have is a 64 multipliers and 129 linear uh, constraints. So you would have one linear constraint for the binary representation, uh, 64 linear constraints uh, between the left and right wire that kind of limits it to be uh, 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 to be zero one, and uh, 64 uh, linear constraints setting the output wires to uh, zero. So 
is the like is the setting so far kind of clear before we move forward? Seems like yes. <laughs> cool. Or maybe I lost the whole audience then by this thing. All right. So uh, okay. So with uh, with this in mind, uh, uh, we'll. Oh yeah, I talked about that we can allocate the multiplier. We add the constraints. We also have the challenge scalers talk about right now, uh, but this is also kind of a cool extension to build Uh We'll kind of come back to this as a maybe a bonus point. So let's uh, go down into the uh, kind of death valley. Uh, so I, I will I will not actually go much kind of deep into all this like arithmetic kind of uh, conversions, but I will uh, explain the the idea behind them. Uh, so uh, so if you kind of really feel like that, you you, you could you could go and you know repeat the you know, you know, all these algebraic transformations, but they're really kind of very boring and at the same time kind of not much kind of not very interesting. So. The idea behind all of the rest of this uh, documentation is to do kind of three things. One is to, or we have all these multiplicative uh, constraints, we have the linear constraints. We want them to combine into one or two um, non-vector statements. So we kind of need to flatten them in one giant statement. So that's the one thing that we need to do. Second thing is that we need to blind uh, the secrets in the statement. So we need to kind of transform that statement that is in term of pure uh, pure secrets to transform it in a statement of uh, the secrets that have some blinding factors applied. And third, uh, we need this final statement to be in a form where we have the inner product uh, of two vectors kind of one giant inner product of two vectors on one side that involves all these low level variables. So we could use the very efficient inner product argument and the sufficient vector commitment together on one side. And on the other side, all, uh, the linear combination of the high level variables V. So we kind of need to transform and do some uh, uh, kind of super annoying, but pretty kind of straightforward transformations of, of our statements to come to this form. And once we get to this form, then we could uh, kind of easily turn this into, uh, uh, kind of homomorphically turn it into a statement of, over Peterson commitments, and then separately apply the inner product argument. So to do that, uh, we'll use basically a single cryptographic trick, which is sampling a uh, fiat Shamir uh, challenge variable. For instance, if you have the vector, so th this is where the trick is explained, and, and we use this trick three times. So whenever you have a list of statements in a form of something must equal zero, and you have the vector of those, then uh, you could flatten it by multiplying by the powers of certain uh, random uh, challenge variable and setting the, uh, the result of this inner product to zero. So now you have a single statement, effectively saying that certain polynomial in this uh, random variable should be zero. And uh, uh, if this is true for each of those random uh, challenges, then certainly it implies that the original statements are all true. Of course, we cannot you know, test every challenge. So uh, we'll use the Fiat Shamir trick where we would kind of force the prover to commit to the, uh, uh, to the uh, inputs of the original statements, and then we'll uh, use the random uh, challenge scalar uh, uh, to, to compute this uh, product. And then we'll have a you know, uh, very low chance that they, uh, they cheated and uh, made the resulting statement to be true. So uh, we'll use the statement to flatten first the uh, uh, multiplicative relation with the powers of uh, challenge y. And then we'll be uh, uh, where is it? Yeah, so this is like the first one. 
so our uh, statement in terms of this uh, ah sorry I missed it so we'll do this uh, for the multiplicative relations and then for the uh, linear uh, relations we'll use, we'll do the same trick with the powers of z so we'll have two challenges y and z so we'll flatten two of them uh, next uh, what we're going to do so so far we're going to have the two of those next the super annoying part is to rearrange the terms so that we could um uh, form the one giant inner product of all this like low low level variables so this is super annoying and we'll just kind of scroll down to that but this really doesn't use any cryptographic tricks it's just kind of algebraic transforms uh one uh algebraic trick is to oh sorry actually like the and a cryptographic trick starts in the very end where if we have the uh, sum of two inner products and we want to combine them to one then we construct yet another polynomial in uh, terms of a third challenge scalar that we call x and we construct this very artificial polynomial uh, uh, so if we have like a by b plus c by d then we have this one here and the second degree of this polynomial will be exactly what we need. So uh, kind of using this trick, we uh, go back to our terms that we have at hand, which are, you can see that on the left side, you have the linear combination of all the external factors with some combination of the challenges and, and constants. So the only secrets here are the uh, high level variables and on the right side we have this artificial polynomial and we only care about its second degree but the whole polynomial is a uh, one giant um, inner product of two vectors with a horrible mix of the uh, y challenge x challenge and the z challenge ah, sorry the z challenge is completely outside the school all right so this is our kind of first step. The, uh, the second step is to blind the terms of this uh, the product argument that we'll be using later is not zero knowledge. So it's made much more efficient by not caring about hiding data and blinding factors. So you just prove that multiplication of two vectors is such and such without, uh, in, in a very efficient uh, space. Uh, but to do uh, to do that in zero knowledge, you have to care about blind factors one step before inner product uh, protocol. So this is what we're do doing doing here. Uh, so we are effectively uh, uh, expanding our uh, polynomial, uh, which like second degree of we are uh, caring about, with this extra blind factors for each of the um, uh, low level variable. So uh, for the left wires, we have the SL uh, blinding kind of vector. Uh, and for the right wires, we have the SR. And those are, so to speak, separated from the original uh, values with the second degree, uh, second power of the uh, challenge X that we introduced uh, in the previous step where we, when we constructed this polynomial. So it turns out that if we do the substitution, with this extra blinding factors, then our vectors in the center product are properly blinded and, and, and we can expose them and they will not leak information, but the second degree of this polynomial would still be the uh, statement that we originally needed uh, to kind of two steps before here. All right. So that's, uh that's our second step so we have this left and right vectors that are these big polynomials and if we multiply them and take the second degree this would be exactly what we need which is what is described here in the section but the vectors themselves are properly blinded so it's easy to see uh right here that the the secret ar uh, has the uh, kind of mix in of sr and the uh, left and output wires are blinded by SL in the left vector. So this is our like first step. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is our second step uh, when we blinded the vectors. And 
kind of the final step uh, before the inner product part is to kind of combine all the pieces together uh, to express uh, the statements in terms of Peterson commitments instead of just just the scalers because so far we were just just talking about the scalers. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to make like another pause. So if someone you know you know lo lost a thread of discussion somewhere, please uh, please ask a question. Um, dumb question. There was a the Y to Z popping around. Um, what, what was that about? Um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, remember that we have two vectors of uh, uh, constraints, the multiplicative ones, uh, let's scroll up here, and the linear ones. So the multiplicative are left by right equals outputs, and the linear ones are those uh, stuff with weights. So to flatten each of the sets, we need separate uh, challenge variables. So for the first one, we'll use the powers of y, just we, we call the challenge variable y. And to flatten the uh, uh, second uh, set, uh, uh, we'll use a variable called z. So the z will, will be flattening the linear constraints, uh, which is uh, over here. So you can see that the multiplicative constraints are flattened with the power of y. Uh, and the uh, linear constraints are all flattened with these powers of z. Uh, there's just one quirk. You could see that we have this one extra z uh, st sticking out. This is just for the, uh, it kind of doesn't really change things, uh, but allows us to um, uh, have kind of kind of cleaner formulas uh, uh, elsewhere because we would be using some extra linear constraint uh, without the power of z at all. And, and our notation, this kind of bold z and power q, means that we start with zero. So it's all zero, uh, zero index. So zq, the, uh, the first element of the vector would be uh, uh, the one, and then z to power one, and then z to power two, et cetera. So the z would actually be separ separating later this statement from uh, the first one. Because now we have two statements, so we'll, we'll be kind of merging together the, oh yeah, you, you can see it here. So we'll be just adding together the flattened multiplicative constraints with flattened linear constraints. And them, they themselves are separated by this extra power of z. So does this make sense so far? Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, after this form, we just have this one uh, single non-vector statement, uh, uh, which is then transformed into this uh, horrible kind of like inner product construction with a second degree in blank vectors. All right. So the third step is to um, uh, make the um, statement in terms of the um, uh, commitments. Now, uh, let's break this down in two halves. So we have one half that has this uh, giant inner product, uh, second degree of this uh, polynomial, and the other half, which doesn't have any inner product, is just a linear combination of the high-level variables. So let's zoom into this um, uh, left part with just high-level variables. If we... Uh, uh, remember that Peterson commitment is this construction where we have the value multiplied by one generator plus some blind factor multiplied by the orthogonal generator. Then we could uh, build this in a diagram where we have original statement uh, multiplied by the primary uh, generator. Uh, and of course, we'll uh, remember that we have the polynomial, so we have a bunch of terms that we don't care about. So uh, the, this central part will be the second degree of some polynomial that we care about, and all the other degrees will be, uh, think of this uh, as committed away, right? So we just want to form commitments to all the other terms of the polynomial, uh, but we don't really care what they are. Like the prover has to compute them, but the verifier doesn't care. Uh, then we uh, take this statement with a, uh, uh, appropriate blinding factors mu multiplied by the uh, uh, secondary generator B tilde. 
and correspondingly for those uh, terms that we don't care about, but we don't want to lick them, so, so there are blending factors for them. And finally, we'll add those two statements together, and we can add them because the generators are orthogonal, so if the uh, uh, resulting sum is true, then the uh, individual portions are also true. And this allows us to uh, use the homomorphism of our group to extract the Peterson commitments from this Bs and the V tildes into the Peterson commitments uh, in, in the first column. In the second column, uh, we don't need to apply the blinding factor to all this kind of constant uh, and, and clear text values. So there's just zero added. This, these are all variables that are known to the verifier. And you can see that we have this commitments ti uh, to all these other terms of the polynomial that we don't care about, but these are proper Peterson commitments that we have to transmit. Uh, so we commit to, to the whole polynomial, and then we get, uh, get a chance to squeeze the challenges. Uh, and finally, as a result of adding all these uh, blinding factors, we have the T tilde, which is the synthetic blinding factor, which is not really a blinding factor, it's just our artifact that we need to have so things are uh, uh, balanced, right? So if we are adding some uh, blind factor over here, then to make the equation work, we need to add a corresponding you know, value on the, on the other side. Uh, and these t, t i tilde would be blinding those blind factors over here. So this whole t, t tilde x is not going to be secret, it's going to be transmitted, but it by itself will not Going to leak any information. So, if you look now on the leftmost column, kind of transitioning to the bottom row, then this is our statement from the verifier's perspective in terms of the um, commitments, not in terms of the uh, uh, secrets, which is pretty cool, right? Uh, so, we, we now have the statement to check um, uh, where we don't show any secrets anymore, we just have the commitments. So that's kind of first half of the third step. The second half of the third step is the other side of our original equation, which is the inner product. And this, is, uh, uh, this also requires some preparations before we get into the inner product argument. So remember that we have this left and right vectors uh, that are blinded, here they are. They're a little bit ugly because we have all these powers of y and uh, 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 powers of x uh, sprinkled all over the place. And we need to make some transformation to have clean commitments to those uh, low-level variables. If you remember, uh, I said that all, all these uh, wires under the multiplication gates, they're all uh, uh, nicely committed using vector Peterson commitments, where uh, no matter how many you have, you just have a constant number of points representing the commitment to them. So uh, we'll do a little transformation. We'll be kind of factoring out these powers of y2 and kind of moving them on the other side so that uh, uh, we could have a clean commitment to the uh, left and right wires before we even know the challenge y. So we're effectively... What is happening here? Uh, we want to move this power of y on the other side. Uh, and oh, uh, I'm sorry. This is the uh, uh, this is the definition of our vector Peterson commitment. So we have a bold G, which is a list of uh, uh, generate some generators. Uh, the bold H, which is another list of generators for the uh, uh, the the right wires, and all of these generators are all uh, orthogonal. So all the generators, including the B, B tilde, the list of Gs, and the list of Hs, they're all orthogonal to each other. So the, uh, uh, they cannot like mess with, uh, with each other, right? So the vector Peterson commitment is the commitment uh, to, uh, in, in our case, it's the commitment to two vectors plus the spline factor with B tilde. And it's kind of like arbitrary choice, but uh, it really matter. We have three sets of vectors, so we commit to the left and right in one. We call it A inputs, and to the outputs we commit as A outputs. So this way we'll have a kind of clean uh, construction. Uh, also, we have some you know additional helper notation to you know kind of minimize the amount of noise. 
And this is the thing where we can factor out the power, powers of y's on the other you know, side of the right, uh, right vector. So we kind of do the similar uh, kind of diagram construction as we did in the uh, first half, where we um, take our uh, uh, description of the left vector and the right vector, multiply them by corresponding uh, generators, and add together to form the statement in terms of the commitments. So we want to, the goal here is to take the commitments to our uh, low level variables, which are AI and AO, uh, including this S, which is the commitment to the blind factors, and get to the form where we have the, um, the vector, uh, uh, like the left vector, uh, and the right vector expressed, you know, clearly. So this allows us to uh, kind of bind the uh, our kind of artificially constructed uh, vectors of scalars to the commitments of our low-level variables. So we'll, we'll like it will be a little bit clearer how we use it in the inner product argument. Uh, but the kind of takeaway here is that we we have all these low level variables. We need to have commitments to them, and then uh, somehow tie them to the uh, to this uh, two artificial uh, vectors that we'll be multiplying uh, in a format that would be friendly to the inner product argument uh, to kind of finish up the uh, the proof. So uh, let let me pause here for a second. So if anyone has a question, or maybe I'm gonna glossed over some things. Is it still here? Yes. Yes, we're here. Cool. Eight of us. <laughs> All right, all right, so we're almost done. At, I don't know if you see participants. There's a little button called participants. You can actually see, or if you go into but the chat. Last part, was, yeah, last part was quite hardcore, so we need to time to process it. Yeah. All right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the good, good thing is there's a, kind of all, all, all the details are in the in the documentation, so if you want to kind of really slowly good, get through all the, uh, all the steps, they're all, you know, carefully uh, preserved. Uh, but the kind of you know the big big takeaway is that we have uh, uh, these original you know vectors of statements. We flattened them. Now we have this you know horrible flat statement, which we want to re uh, uh, rearrange into this inner product on one side and some kind of linear uh, statement about the high level variables on the other side, and then. We for for this like horrible part on the on 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 the inner product side, we need to uh, extract the commitments like vector commitments to all these low level variables and tie them to our vectors, and then as a final part, we need to prove indirectly that these vectors are uh, when they multiply, they give us the proper uh, left side, which we had you know above without wasting linear space. So that's like the final kind of cool part of the book proofs that kind of gives the, you know, compact uh, compact proofs. Okay, so, um, so if you're gonna, you know, uh, take my word that these uh, left and right vectors are, you know, uh, tied to this uh, uh, vector commitments to the low level variables in this shape, then we end up with this statement where we have some point P, which is uh, the inner pro uh, oh sorry, which is this kind of uh, combination of the left and right vectors, and this H is now kind of transformed. It has this hat because we moved the powers of Y to it, so it's sort of like transmuted uh, generator, but doesn't really uh, uh, change the semantics of this. So. This equal to this combination of the commitments to the inputs and outputs of the multipliers and the blinding factors. And at the same time, we have this Tx, uh, which uh, um, 
which is the uh, evaluation of this blinded flattened polynomial from the from, from the previous step. Now the uh, thing to keep in mind is that L and R can be simply transmitted to the verifier, and the verifier could check this uh, relation to uh, to that statement, and then uh, simply multiply the L and R to get the TX. So they could do that, and this would be completely safe and in zero knowledge because the L is blinded, R is blinded. And if you multiply them and get this proper TX, which you separately check above over here to the high level variables, and everything. So uh, the the only gotcha is that L and R are uh, vectors of the size of number of multipliers. So if you have let's say 64 multipliers, then you have to transmit two times. Uh, like 128 uh, uh, scalars. So that's kind of linear size of the proof. So that would be very nice. Um, and uh, to kind of compress down this proof and avoid transmitting the left and right vectors in clear text, we need the inner product protocol, which is the final step. So this is the step where we say the uh, we have indirect commitment to these left and right vectors, and we have the result of the, of the multiplication of those. Uh, and we simply want to prove to you that we uh, 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 we know those vectors and we uh, committed to them, but uh, we do not need to transmit them uh, uh, as a whole. So we can transmit some, you know, kind of smaller, uh, smaller amount of data to prove that. So that would be our final step: the inner product protocol, which is oh, doesn't work. Cool. Probably the link is that, but <clears throat> it's over here. So if you go back to the notes, this is the inner product proof, a separate link, where we um, start with uh, this a little bit kind of abstract uh, annotation to, uh, to, to kind of keep things clear. So we, we forget about the powers of Y, powers of X, powers of Z, all this weights, all this stuff. We just focus on the one thing that we have two vectors of scalars, and uh, we uh, have uh, some result of their multiplication, and we have this commitment to those vectors with uh, generators G and H, and we want to prove this relation. So uh, we'll kind of simplify things. We'll have just a uh, notation of vectors A and vector B. And so we have the C as a their multiplication. So C is a, a times B, like in a product. And the point P would be the kind of unblinded commitments to the vector of A and vector of B. All right. So we need to prove the knowledge with, without zero knowledge. So we assume that A and B already, you know, are not um, uh, not, not having any sensitive. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the, they're not leaking any information. So we need to prove this relation that P is this this commitment to to the vectors A and B, and that lowercase C is the their inner product. Now to kind of do that, we first do the flattening, right? So we have two statements, uh, one statement and another, and we need to flatten them. And we'll use exactly the same trick as we did before. So we have yet another challenge, W, uh, which would be applied to uh, the second statement. And remember that the first one is in terms of the group elements. Uh, and the second one is in terms of scalars. So we also need to bring it to the uh, to the group elements with the orthogonal generator. In our case, it would be B. So it's orthogonal to, to G and H. So we'll use the challenge W and also throw in the uh, generator B. So now adding everything together, we get to kind of this form doing kind of uh, a little bit of renaming so, so we don't have to worry about extra, you know, Kind of clear text letters, we see this nice form where some point P, a prime that we know, is a sum of uh, A's by generator G, B's by generators H, and their inner product by some extra point Q, which is uh, just the, this, you know, kind of challenge uh, multiplied by the orthogonal generator B. And finally, uh, 
there is kind of one uh, kind of compression trick in the inner product protocol that we would be using recursively until we compress things down to the vectors of the length one. So, uh, uh, so I will just kind of explain this, and this will be basically the end of the of the story, kind of tying things together. So we'll uh, look at this. Uh, uh, sorry, we'll uh, start by splitting each of the vectors a and b into two halves. So the a will be uh, consisting of the low half and the high uh, high half. So if you have, for instance, sixty-four elements, then you will have lower thirty-two elements as low, and higher uh, thirty-two elements as uh, high half. And uh, we would be using uh, a variable that would call it u. And since we'll, it's a, like a recursive algorithm. It, will be UK because at each, uh, it's not because the United Kingdom, it's because at each step it will be like K step. So it's uh, from the uh, kind of, we'll, we'll be kind of splitting half those vectors uh, in, in K steps. And K will be, of course, logarithmic because we're having, having the vectors. So it's a logarithm of our number, um, uh, number of elements. So let's take a look. So if we can choose the powers of these challenges and uh, deliberately kind of use this uh, kind of flattening of the halves of the vectors onto themselves with these uh, powers, uh, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, et cetera, and compose our original statement, then we'll see a very cool thing. Uh, if we rearrange, uh, kind of open the parenthesis, then the cool part would be that uh, we'll get a new point, p uh, k minus 1, like an, an, a new uh, group element, which we don't know what, what its meaning is. But we'll see that uh, the low and high halves are nicely kind of jumping out together that are exactly the same as they were in the previous step. So this is a low by g low plus a high by g high. So we're kind of, kind of splitting half the, those generators. And this is exactly this. Uh, same as a by g in the previous step. Uh, while all the cross terms, like low by high and high by low, all the cross terms are sort of separated away by this non-zero powers of uh, this random challenges. So what does it mean? It means that um, we now have the uh, original statement with a new point that is uh, is produced with shorter vectors. Remember that we can flatten the vectors. We took the a low half multiplied by a challenge and added a high half multiplied by another power of challenge. So we can flatten those uh, vectors and we could construct this point. But at the same time, this point is exactly the same as our original point, plus a lot of garbage kind of cross terms multiply by the powers of this challenge. So this means that uh, we could repeat this step until our vectors to compute the resulting point are of length one, and we would have the logarithmic number of garbage with the logarithmic number of challenges added to it. So this is how it looks like. You, after first step of doing that, you would see this original point here plus the garbage, plus get more garbage, and this would be a new point. So you could compute this new, new point through, uh, by, by using the shorter vectors, but you would not do, do this right away until you do the step once again uh, and uh, get down to vectors of length one, so that you could construct this P0 through just one uh, scalar A, one scalar B, and one multiplication of the single scalar a and single scalar b so this you could compute with just you know kind of constant size uh, part of the proof which is simply uh, kind of 64 bytes uh, of the proof and you would have to add those uh, commitments that we call like left and right l and r commitments to all these cross terms with the uh, like properly multiplied by the challenges uh, uh, uj Right. Whew. So uh, this is kind of how the inner product 
works. So to kind of reiterate, you uh, you do this uh, trick by compressing vectors onto themselves and uh, commit to the cross terms. So you only transmit the resulting uh, just tiny kind of pair of scalars, and uh, the verifier would be uh, uh, kind of hashing those cross term commitments to generate the challenges and then simply verify that this this statement is correct and kind of due to how the uh, those challenges were uh, computed it, the verifier is convinced that the prover has uh, properly compressed the uh, the vectors on their end uh, so so they had to originally have proper um, uh, proper long vectors that they did not transmit and this concludes the proof. So now we can plug in this uh, uh, proper uh, P from the uh, rank one constraints, like this horrible, you know, flattened statement about the high level variables and the low level, uh, uh, like low level wires uh, from the multipliers. So we'll plug all these things and have this extra overhead of the inner product uh, protocol, which is commitments L and R. Uh, so these will be like logarithmic number of those, plus the scalars A and B as the final compressed vectors. And that's kind of how it kind of ties together the whole kind of bulletproof system. So in the end, if we go back, uh, we'll end up with this one statement. Uh, let me scroll, ah, probably not here. But in the In the diagram. Hey, Oleg, I think we're going to have to yeah. wrap up pretty soon. We've had a couple of people yeah. to bounce, but are you? Yeah. Are yeah, we, I think, no, this, this is just the it. end. We just, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we made it, and yeah. now I'm just open to the questions. Sounds good. So, so yeah, I, just I would to say... show you that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying that uh, after you plug all the things together, you end up with this giant one verification statement where we have the parts from the inner pro uh, inner product protocol and all these kind of hanging pieces from the like other statements that we have accumulated so far. So you just check this one giant multi-scalar multiplication. That's and that's the end of it. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So anyone who survived so far could please ask questions. Oh, I think someone actually put a question in the chat. Is bulletproof okay. still the state of the art protocol for range proofs? Uh, well, it depends on the use case. Oh, by the way, why can't I just switch to, oh yeah, here it is. So- um, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't in Telegram, it was in the chat in Zoom. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, so, well, what do they mean by the state of, of the art? So if you if you need to do the range proof uh, uh, with uh, well, I guess if you just need to do the range proof, then uh, the bulletproofs are pretty compact and fast, uh, like gonna probably even faster than zk snarks. Maybe I'm not sure, uh, and the proof size is pretty small, so uh, uh, maybe it is. Uh, uh, but maybe if you have some other, you know, proofs around it, then uh, can I, uh, if, you, if, if you don't just have the range proof, but you need some, you know, a, a, other things to check, then uh, uh, you probably would kind of consider bulletproofs for other reasons. So I'm kind of not quite sure how to just okay. say whether it's just still there. But if you just need for the range proofs, it's uh, kind of, it's 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 very you know, fast and you it's like doesn't have the trusted setup so you don't need to you know set things up you just you just construct your statement and you, you go with it like like a like a Schnorr signature or something so it should be pretty convenient for that for the purpose. Oh, and he just said thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Do you see the oh, notes? Here. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I see. Oh, I see the chat finally. All right. So, dip. 
cool. Yeah, so, so our, our, yeah, our implementation is state of the art in terms of all this uh, kind of known ZK snark implementations. So with a non pairing, like in a traditional curve. Uh, so if you're, if, if you're not comparing with any of kind of like ZK snark uh, type of proofs, then uh, our implementation is state of the art. Um, thanks for uh, one question was more about like, how would it compare to something like the green paper or the green implementation of this or how does that compare to what we just learned today and what you've implemented? Uh, so the green uh, green you mean the member wimble, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I, I didn't appreciate how detailed it was. So thank you for your time today. So cool. Yeah, uh, so I'm not sure whether green uses the uh, 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 kind of Bitcoin curve or the uh, curve to 5519 or a strata group. Uh, I'm kind of not up to date. Uh, but our comparison with uh, kind, of, kind of second best implementation for the SEC P256K1, to to uh, uh, we have something like you know two x uh, verification uh, improvement, and with if it's like three x. And Monero has implemented uh, range proofs over uh, curve to fifty five nineteen, and uh, they didn't do this safely. So they don't they don't build it over the Restretto group. They they build it like over the kind of group with the cofactor, and so it's not quite safe. But we're like seven times faster than that. So. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure which one Green uses. Yeah, no, that's so, cool. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Um, who Doc. else? Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I would say um, if there are any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna sort of sign off now, and to everyone who's participated. Mm -hmm. So glad you're here. And to those who yeah. didn't and are listening or watching, um, actually, Oleg, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can ping me on the on the group. I have the Oleg Ganza Twitter and GitHub and Telegram handle. So here it is. So you could just use that. Very good. Cool. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, sorry for taking too long. No yeah. worries.